Welcome to this next lecture on describing functions. So, now we are going to use the jump hysteresis in particular we are going to study the jump hysteresis and find out the amplitude and frequency for oscillations uh, when that is connected to a first order system. It is a first order system that we will connect it to and uh, find out the amplitude and frequency. So, while doing this we should note that the transfer function to which we connect should have some low pass characteristics. Yeah, this we described only briefly in our previous lecture. So, note that this describing function method is a approximation method. method. Yeah, we'll, this is a jump hysteresis. What was the jump hysteresis? Let us recall this. Let us call this the R, R of t which is equal to a sin omega t. This value is minus b, this value is plus b, this is the output. Suppose this is y of t, this is y of t. What are the two graphs? When r dot is positive, that I mean it traverses this curve, then it jumps down when r, when the uh, rate of change of r changes its sign, this jumps down here and it traverses this path when r dot is negative and when r dot again changes sign and becomes positive it jumps up. Yeah? In that sense this is a hysteresis this uh, jump amount is 2 b why because there is this bias up by amount b when r dot is positive that is a bias downwards by amount b when the uh, rate of change of the input is negative. So, now we uh, should note that if we want to equate only the first harmonic, yeah, after all note, note that the describing function which is a function in general of both amplitude and omega is only first harmonic. Based on the first harmonic we decided to call this as a gain. Of course, there is a more systematic method where we can use a higher harmonics also and use that to define the describing function that is indeed a more advanced topic. and that is explained in detail in Hassan Khalil's book on nonlinear systems, but that is outside the scope of this course. Nor do we teach that, we do not teach that either in the uh, regular uh, IIT Bombay nonlinear dynamical systems course. So, coming back to the fact that the disturbing function was only the first harmonic, we will like to have an argument, some justification why the higher harmonics do not play much role. Yeah, the ignoring aspect of the higher harmonics is what makes the describing function only an approximation method for finding the frequency and amplitude of the periodic orbits. But suppose G was a low pass filter, yeah? suppose G was low pass, then we can indeed say that the higher harmonics are going to be amplified less by G and to what extent it is low pass decides the accuracy of the calculation that we that we accuracy of the solution that we get by using this calculation procedure yeah this describing function that we get by ignoring the second harmonic and onwards the second harmonic and harmonic and onwards has some information which we have ignored that information ignoring is justified if g is a low pass filter yeah so Please note whenever, yeah, I forgot a minus sign here. Uh, please note whenever we use the descending function method to calculate the frequency and amplitude of the periodic orbit, one should check that G is a low pass filter. If G is a high pass filter, then the calculations are expected to be very wrong. The sufficient conditions for existence and the sufficient conditions for non existence are very likely to fail. So, suppose G was low pass, uh, was a low pass filter then ignoring 
higher harmonics justified yeah this is justified if g was a low pass filter okay so now we will take an example let g of s be equal to minus of s plus 1 over 3s plus 1 yeah so this uh, is the example that we will take so uh, is this a low pass filter that we can check so for s equal to 0 the dc gain is 1 0 db that is incidental yeah. then at the first we encounter is a pole a 1 by 3 radians per second because it is a pole the ma magnitude starts decreasing at the rate of 20 decibels per second this is an asymptotic plot until we encounter a 0 which is 1 radians per second and after that it flattens. Yeah, so, this is indeed some low pass filter of course, the duration of decrease is not much, but then if it had been low pass if the decrease were for a longer duration for a longer band of frequency then the accuracy of the resulting uh, amplitude and frequency the accuracy would have been more it would have been more accurate. So, we have done the needful of checking that G is a low pass filter. So, now consider G of S connected with the jump stresses yeah so now one should check that 1 plus eta of a the jump stresses we saw was um, again independent of omega yeah so check for intersection of intersection of minus 1 by eta of a and g of j omega on the complex plane the Nyquist plot of g and the curve minus 1 over eta of a these two we plot and we check for the intersection. We can do this separately notice that only because this is a function of only a and this is a function of only omega. If eta were a function of omega also then their intersection is not enough you see because they also have to intersect for the same value of omega here and here because of this particular convenient form in which one of the one of the parameters a affects only one function eta of a the other parameter omega affects only other other function g because of this particular separation in which they affect the two functions eta and g one is able to plot them separately and look for the intersection Plotting G in particular is easy because it is nothing but the Nyquist plot. But then we, we will now ask the question for for eta of A for this jump stresses we already know how it looks. But instead of plotting minus 1 over eta of A, why do not we plot the transfer uh, Nyquist plot of minus 1 over G. So, this which we have written here can also be seen as alternatively. eta of a and minus 1 over g of j omega yeah these two intersecting is also equally helpful equally good it is exactly the same there is no difference between the two procedures for the jump stresses eta of a was equal to m plus and some constants let me just look this up so i just look this up so, the constants are 4 here and pi here. The second part, the imaginary uh, part, is what we obtained from uh, noting that uh, the jump is nothing but in phase with cos omega t, which is the derivative of sin omega t, and uh, that is why we uh, just wrote this. Yeah? So this is nothing but m plus 4bj over by a we, we are used to writing the constants before the variables and hence this. So, how does the plot of this look? Let us say m is equal to 2, b is equal to 1, amplitude we are not sure, yeah, amplitude is a 
uh, variable and we have to adjust the amplitude according to the intersection. So, this is m equal to 2, the real part is constant. So, for a equal to 0, it is way up and this is where it reaches for a equal to infinity and this is 2, this is a point 2. What about minus, minus 1 over g of s for our example is equal to 3 s plus 1 over s plus 1 that happens to be first order transfer functions are Nyquist plots are nothing but a circle. In this case, these are the two points for omega equal to 0, for s equal to 0 we see that it starts at 1 for omega, omega equal to 0 and this is where it is for omega equal to infinity. The Nyquist plot is complete only after you draw the orientations here. Yeah? So, for that purpose we note that this one is uh, we first have a 0 and then a pole. So, in that sense this minus 1 over g is a high pass filter. So, because the phase starts increasing from omega equal to 0, we decide that the arrow should have been like this. So, this is where it indeed intersects. So, it is intersecting the center of this di diameter 1 3 is 2 that is precisely where m equal to 2 is. One can check that this point where it intersects on the topmost point right above the center of the circle has to be the location of the pole. Yeah, I will just quickly write this in another result. So, this particular point we know what value it is. It happens to be nothing but 2 plus j. Yeah, the radius of the circle is 1. So, the imaginary part is equal to 1. So, we should put that this is equal to m, m is equal to 2 m plus 4 b over pi a j which already gives us that m is equal to 2. This of course, we assume that is why we drew this line vertically starting with the real part equal to 2. And what about, uh, so we get the and b was equal to 1, notice that the b was equal to 1. So, pi a equal to 4 b, which gives a is equal to 4 over pi. So, for amplitude a equal to 4 by pi, we have an intersection of eta a curve and minus 1 over g of g omega curve for omega equal, what is the value of omega at which we have this intersection? Eta of a does not depend on omega, but uh, for what value of omega is g of g omega at this point? Yeah, that is not too hard, we will just quickly write this. So, uh, let me just tell you at this place that omega should be equal to 1 radians per second. The exact reason for this is what we will see in the following slide. So, uh, we have obtained the coordinates of this point because it happens to be on the Nyquist plot of minus 1 over g s and eta of a. We know that there is a value of amplitude a for which it intersects this. There is also value of omega for which it intersects this. Those happen to be omega equal to 1 radians per second and a is equal to 4 over pi. Why a is equal to 4 over pi? Of course, we have derived just now. Why omega is 1 radians per second is what we will see very quickly. So, one uh, can check a very simple uh, property. Yeah, suppose you have s plus a over s plus b, yeah? uh, c, c s plus a over s plus b and no, no pole 0 cancellation. Then the Nyquist plot of this happens to be a circle. in which the radius, the center is something, this, these values are nothing but the values, one of them is for omega tending to infinity, one of them is omega equal to 0, which one is which of course, depends on the relative values of c, a and b. Yeah? For omega equal to 0, it is a by b, for omega is equal to infinity, it is c. So, depending on between them, which is higher, which is lower, it will be one of these, that also, that will also decide the orientation, but this point which is right above the center one can check that that is one of this is omega is equal to b radians per second 
the other one will then be omega is equal to minus b radians per second. Yeah? So, one of these points happens to be for plus b radians per second, then the other one will be minus b radians per second. So, why that is the point right above this is not too hard to prove. Yeah, one can easily prove this. One, if you already know this fact, one can substitute this and see. Yeah, I, I also happen to uh, encounter in this in the case of constructing problems for describing functions. So, can verify that imaginary part of g of j omega at omega equal to b plus minus b is equal to radius. Radius of the circle and the real part of g of j omega is nothing but center, center coordinate. This will prove that it is right above the center or right below at both plus and minus b and where b is the pole. Yeah? If the pole is at minus b or plus b, that pole is actually on the real axis, but the corresponding frequency, the corresponding value on the imaginary axis is what makes it exactly above or exactly below the center. Of course, this whole Nyquist plot could have been on the left side depending on the relative values of a, b and c. Yeah, if they are all negative then it could be here or it could also be encircling the origin that depends on the signs of a, b and c. I am just uh, telling you this property that the point right above the center will always be at the frequency corresponding to the pole even though the pole is on the real axis. So, this is the property that we used in our previous example for this jump hysteresis. We our minus 1 over g of s happened to be 3 s plus 1 over s plus 1. So, we said at 1 radians per second is where it should have been. Whether it is plus 1 or minus 1, we, deci we decided that because for omega equal to 0, it increases like this and for omega equal to infinity. So, this point is for minus 1 radians per second. Yeah. For omega equal to minus infinity onwards, it decreases it increases from minus infinity radians per second, minus 1 radians per second and finally, at omega equal to 0 radians per second. So, this point here in this case is minus 1 radians per second and this is 1 radians per second. So, that is the property of first order transfer functions that we used. So, uh, one can ask can we have different uh, omega values? Yeah. So, we can set the different omega value by just changing the value of m. This is a whole family of yeah, once you have plotted minus 1 over g of s like this plot all you have to do and notice that omega equal to 0 to omega equal to infinity this is how it is. You can take different different values of m and check that it will intersect this Nyquist plot at different points. Of course, calculating the precise value will be a little more effort, but if somebody comes to us and tells us that this is the frequency of oscillation I need the frequency is what they can specify. The amplitude can also be specified in fact. Why? Because if the amplitude is specified, one can design B accordingly. Yeah, is this a good problem to work on? So, here is an exercise problem. Consider G of S equal to minus of S plus 1 over 3 S plus 1 use jump hysteresis in feedback, negative feedback. Design the nonlinearity, design the nonlinearity means to design m and b. These are the two parameters that play a role inside the nonlinearity itself. The parameter a is not a property of the nonlinearity because a is the amplitude of the incoming signal, while b is a parameter by how, by how much it will jump is a property of the nonlinearity, and so is the slope. To to have frequency four radians per second and amplitude eight. Amplitude 8 to have periodic of the of the periodic orbits. So, one can ask inside the 
inside the closed loop at which point is it 8 this yeah so 8 sin 4 t at input to nonlinearity this is understood if you want the amplitude to be 8 at some other point one would have to redesign a by uh, the gain of g the gain of g corresponding to 4 radians per second the magnitude of the transfer function g of j omega when evaluated at 4 j the magnitude please note it is not just real part or imaginary part, but the magnitude because amplitude gets magnified by the magnitude of the transfer function. So, this 8 when somebody specifies if you want to use this 8 for a the parameter a then this is at the input to the nonlinearity. our a sin omega t r of t the reference signal r of t equal to a sin omega t is precisely uh, contributing the parameter a into the disturbing function provided that is at the input to the nonlinearity. So, one this is a problem one can pursue and a very good exercise problem that we typically have in our exams here. So, we now come to uh, another problem that we pursued only partially in our previous lecture. This is uh, about how the saturation nonlinearity happens to give periodic orbits for k greater than 60. So, consider again the transfer function g of s over s plus 1 times s plus 2 times s plus 3 and we had saturation nonlinearity. We had saturation nonlinearity, but more generally it is a sector nonlinearity. So, we asked the question, we had already plotted the Nyquist plot of this. We at that point we had only estimated the rightmost vertical line such that the Nyquist plot is still further to the right of this, but rightmost such vertical line. Yeah. While doing that, we had used some ad hoc estimates. The point minus 1 is here this intersection point of course, we said is minus 1 by 60, this is 1 by 6 for this particular example. Now, we let us see a systematic method to calculate the real axis intersection of this vertical line, where this vertical line is satisfying the property that it is tangential to this curve and the Nyquist plot is, for, is to the right of this. Yeah? This property is satisfied for this vertical line also, but we want the rightmost such line. So, we are going to calculate this particular vertical line. So, for that purpose we will find out at which point the real part reaches its extrema. So, this vertical line satisfies the property that because it is vertical the real part of real real part of g of j omega is least at at omega naught which omega naught omega naught is a frequency correspond to this point when the vertical axis which is rightmost is tangential to this Nyquist plot. Yeah. And why is it least? Because real part of g j omega is negative already, it does not become further negative. Yeah. This is the least value of real part of g j omega with sin. So, why do not we just try to differentiate this with respect to omega and put that equal to 0 that would give us this point and this point and maybe actually it will also give us this, but had omega been finite at this point. So, we will do this to find the value omega naught and then we will evaluate g of j omega real part of j j omega at this omega naught. That will be a procedure for finding the rightmost vertical line such that it is tangential to this Nyquist plot. So, g of j omega equal to 1 over which gives us minus omega square plus 3 j omega 
plus 2 which becomes equal to minus j omega cube. Omega square comes from this this term and this term. Yeah, so th minus minus six omega square. J omega comes from this and this. Yeah, so uh, plus nine plus two. So plus eleven J omega. And uh, the extreme most term come from just one. Uh, extreme most uh, degrees come from just one. Just like this came from only the product of this and and this. Like that constant term will come from just product of these both, so plus 6. So, now we are going to find out the real part. So, real part of g of j omega is equal to 6 minus 6 omega square eleven omega minus omega cube plus sign was then the denominator. So, now we have minus sign in the numerator because it is we are going to write its complex conjugate 6 minus 6 omega square square plus 11 omega minus omega cube square. Yeah, this is these are the real parts and imaginary parts. So, we have multiplied by the complex conjugate so that the denominator becomes real and the numerator becomes equal to this. So, now we are ready to split the real part and imaginary part. So, the real part of g of j omega becomes equal to 6 minus 6 omega square divided by plus 11 omega minus omega cube whole square. Yeah? So, this real part we want to know for what value of omega this one reaches its least value we expect that this becomes negative and the least value it attains is a val value the value itself is of relevance and the value of omega at which this least value is attained will give us uh, the point at which it is tangential to that particular curve uh, vertical line. So, because this has a very high degree in the denominator what is easier is we will yeah ok we can just differentiate this with respect to omega this gives us this is like different, uh, differentiating numerator by denominator. So, this is nothing but the denominator whole square, the denominator itself omega minus omega cube whole square times derivative of the numerator which is nothing but minus 12 omega yeah, plus minus uh, 6 minus 6 omega square times derivative of the denominator again divided by the denominator square. This which denominator is this? Is this the denominator of the transfer function g of s, but it is not the denominator of the transfer function, but it is this particular denominator that we have written here. Yeah, one can of course use a uh, some simplification and uh, differentiate the inverse of this rather than this itself, uh, but then we decided to just do the routine procedure. So, we have to differentiate the denominator here which is uh, 2 times 6 minus 6 omega square times the derivative of minus 6 omega square which is minus 12 omega plus this seems to be a very lengthy calculation. So, at the end we have d by d omega real part of g of j omega equal to 0. We want to extract out only the numerator you see. So, uh, the numerator we will get by picking out terms this entire part we will pick that there is still something continuation. Yeah? So, which we will write directly here minus 12 omega times six minus six omega square square plus 
11 omega minus omega cube square minus 6 minus 6 omega square times minus 24 omega times 6 minus 6 omega square plus derivative of this term yeah that that is what that that is what remain 2 times 11 omega minus omega cube times the derivative of this term itself which is 11 minus 3 omega square yeah this this multiplied to this so this equal to 0 is what we want to solve so let us try to get rid of various uh, factors there are just too many things to cancel yeah i think it is easier that we differentiate the inverse of this one can try to pursue this and check that we get the same answer as this other thing that we will pursue what is this other thing that we will pursue we have that we want to find out when this real part reaches its extrema instead of checking when the real part of this reaches its extrema we will differentiate the inverse of this yeah inverse of the real part of g of j omega is equal to 6 minus 6 omega square plus 11 omega minus omega cube square divided by 6 minus 6 omega square yeah this is uh, the inverse how did i get this i just took the inverse of this expression to take the inverse of this means we cancel off one factor here and we have this square divided by 6 minus 6 omega square yeah now we are going to differentiate d by d omega of this 1 over real part of g of j omega and we get this equal to minus 12 omega plus 6 minus 6 omega square whole square times denominator times derivative of the numerator 6 minus 6 omega square 11 the derivative of this is 11 omega minus omega cube times 11 minus 3 omega square minus the this factor times the derivative of this yeah so minus 11 omega minus omega cube whole square divided by 6 minus 6 omega square whole square times the derivative of the denominator which is equal to minus 12 omega yeah it appears to be only slightly simpler first thing we will notice we can extract out a factor omega and cancel off from everything yeah so indeed one of the extrema is at omega equal to 0 that we knew after cancelling off a factor omega let us simplify this so this comes to minus 12 times 6 minus 6 omega square whole square we have plus 6 minus 6 omega square times 11 minus omega square we have we have uh, cancelled a factor omega here this term comes as it is then here we have cancel of this omega here plus plus 12 times 11 minus omega square whole square times omega square yeah this is a pretty big long calculation that we have got which we will now start simplifying further so first thing to notice is that whatever this whole thing is equal to 0 this is all the numerator at the denominator we have 6 minus 6 omega square whole square and that is uh, anyway in the denominator so first thing to notice is this is an even power of omega i mean only even uh, powers of omega come into this expression that is also expected because if some value of omega is a root minus of that is also a root so wh why don't we first replace omega square by some uh, variable x yeah that will indeed reduce the degrees and uh, give us more courage to go through this expression evaluate further 
So, now we will uh, open these brackets. So, we have 6 x minus 6 whole square times times 12 plus 6 minus 6 x. Uh, perhaps we can cancel off uh, 6 some constant this 12 this 6 there is there are enough uh, constants also that we should be cancelling before we uh, too many large numbers only causes more uh, calculation mistakes. So, there is uh, quite some laborious calculations involved. So, let me just show what I have been doing. So, this is where we last obtained and uh, I said that this is an even function only even powers of omega are going to appear in the resulting expression. So, why do not we replace omega square with x and then there is some simplification I have been doing and after expanding all the brackets we eventually get this third order polynomial. Yeah? So, this polynomial is expected to have three roots at least one of them is real at least one real root. So, it will require some effort it will require some solver to find out this real root whether it is positive or negative is the important thing for us. So, need to check need to check at least one positive root why do we need at least one positive root at least one real root is guaranteed because this is a cubic polynomial. So, for very large values of x tending to plus infinity and x tending to minus infinity it is going to change its sign yeah, for x tending to plus infinity because of this minus sign here it goes to minus infinity and for x tending to minus infinity it, it becomes plus infinity. Yeah, so, somewhere in the middle it will cross for some value of x that is why it, this whole polynomial has a real root, but that real root is for x. So, for omega square if omega should have a real root then this uh, polynomial should have at least one positive real root. Yeah? So, once that is set once that is obtained then that we will equate for omega square and we will take square root of that positive root and that will give us the value of omega where it is uh, coming leftmost and we can evaluate the real part of g of j omega at that particular value and that will give us the leftmost point leftmost meaning the real ax the real part of g of j omega is the least it is negative it is expected to be negative and it will be the least this can be verified using scilab for example. So, we uh, will do a very similar calculation for a simpler transfer function yeah, also for the same purpose. So, uh, at the end of this calculation one can check that this is less than minus 1 by 60. Yeah. So, what is it that we had already used in our previous lecture? for g of s equal to 1 over s plus 1 s plus 2 s plus 3 we already saw that this point is minus 1 by 60 this point is 1 by 6 and minus 1 is somewhere here. So, we expect that this real axis intersection at when it is tangential happens to be left of minus 1 by 60 for example, minus 1 by 50 of course, exact value needs to be verified by the procedure that I have said. That value we have also seen uh, is related to the circle criteria that is the largest sector for time varying nonlinearities, sector bound time varying nonlinearities in the sector 0 to k. Yeah. That k value can be found by this you find the vertical axis intersection with the negative real axis and take the inverse of that that will also be negative multiply minus sign to that that will give us this value. We expect that this value will be less than 60 for that same reason, but of course, we expect it to be much more than 1 much more than plus 1. We will take another example yeah, for which we will find a similar value and uh, also for that we will uh, use a jump hysteresis and evaluate if there are oscillations if there are uh, if there is an oscillation if there are periodic orbits and what are the, what is the frequency and the amplitude. So, take g of s equal to 1 over s square plus s plus 2. So, the Nyquist plot of this So, this is for omega equal to 0 
decreases like this, omega tending to infinity it becomes like this. Yeah. So, notice that the point minus 1 is here, this is equal to 1 by 2. The entire negative real axis is not encircled, which means for the whole sector of linearities in the range 0 to infinity sector of linearities. Each linearity in this range, in this sector means any line of slope, any positive slope, take any line, this is the input, this is the output and take any line with positive slope. Suppose this line of positive slope, slope is equal to let us say 10, then this point corresponds to minus 1 by 10 here. This line of slope 10 plus 10 corresponds to point minus 1 by 10. This minus 1 by 10 is not encircled and this has poles in the left half complex plane. Because it has poles in the left half complex plane, p is equal to 0, n is equal to 0 for the point minus 1 by 10. Hence, the number of closed loop poles is also equal to 0. This will happen for every point on the negative real axis. Every point on the negative real axis just corresponds to a line inside this sector. So, for sector of linearities, we conclude that we have closed loop stability. Now, we want to ask the same question for sector of time invariant nonlinearities and for the sector of time varying nonlinearities of the form 0 to k. So, when we ask the question for a sector of time varying nonlinearities, that is when we have to apply the circle criteria and again find such a line which is tangential to this curve, tangential to this Nyquist plot. So, we are going to find real part of g of j omega. We expect the calculation will be simpler because this is only a second order system. 1 over 2 minus omega square plus j omega, real part of this, yeah. Real part of this, which is equal to 2 minus omega square minus, om minus j omega divided by 2 minus omega square square plus omega square real part of this which is equal to so we uh, get this as a real part so we are going to again now con conveniently differentiate the inverse of the real part of g of j omega that will just give us of 2 minus omega square plus omega square over 2 minus omega square. This is what we are going to differentiate with respect to omega and equate that to 0 to get us to get the value of omega. So, what is the derivative? The derivative this is nothing but minus 2 omega plus 2 minus omega square times 2 omega minus omega square times minus 2 omega whole divided by 2 minus omega square whole square. Yeah, this is the derivative of this expression. So, this uh, we will uh, evaluate this minus 2 omega plus we get here 2 omega we can take in common and uh, when we do that we get 2 minus omega square plus omega square. If, if I have not done any calculation mistakes, 2 omega when we take common what remains is plus omega square and here it is nothing but 2 minus omega square and this is equal to we can now again take 2 omega common minus 1 plus something over omega square minus 2 whole square because it is being squared we can reverse the sequence here and in above here we have only 2 which is equal to 2 omega over omega square minus 2 whole square here we have 2 minus the square of this yeah, which is nothing but omega to the power 4 plus 4 omega square minus 
4. So this is what we get as the derivative. So we are going to equate yeah, d by d omega of 1 over real part of g of j omega equal to 0 gives us either omega equal to 0 or or uh, omega is a root of or omega is root of root of what omega to the power 4 minus 4 omega square plus 2 it is the root of this polynomial. Yeah? So, finding the root of this polynomial is what remains this is what we will do next. Uh, so, let us find the root of x square minus 4 x plus 2. So, does we, we want this to have real roots first of all. Secondly, we want at least one root to be positive. Why we want one root to be positive? Because we are going to take square root of that to get the root in omega eventually. So, this indeed satisfies that property it has both real roots because the discriminant is not negative. So, x is equal to 4 plus minus square root of b square minus 4 ac that is 16 minus 8 minus 8 divided by 2 that is equal to 4 plus minus square root of 8 which is 2 square root of 2 where 2 this is 2 plus minus square root of 2. So, for two values of uh, x we are getting this root. So, we need to be able to interpret for each of this. So, uh, notice that we have plotted 1 over uh, re real part of g of j omega that uh, procedure itself might have introduced some more roots. We do not expect, uh, we only expect at omega equal to 0 of course and at another value of omega which will be negatives of each other. We do not expect so many. So, uh, since we have got so many what is easiest is to just remove the spurious ones by evaluating the real part of g of j omega at each of these and we expect one of them to be negative yeah when evaluated at square root of these so uh, that would give us uh, correct one that is what we can do right away so we will take omega to be equal to square root of 2 plus square root of 2 and then we'll also take omega to be equal to square root of 2 minus square root of 2 both are positive you see 2 is uh, more than square root of 2 square root of 2 uh, because because we are taking square root of a number larger than 1 of course the square root will be lower than that number so both of these will be uh, quantities that are positive that are that are real so we will need to evaluate g of j omega real part of g of j omega at at each of these at at, at both and we uh, expect that the real part will be a minima at one of these. The fact that it is a minima can also be verified by finding the second derivative of uh, real part of g of j omega with respect to omega when differentiate with respect to omega if the second derivative is positive then we expect then we know that this is a local minima. Alternatively for 1 over real part of g of j omega we can check that it is a maxima at which of these two points. Uh, one also needs to see carefully why the extra roots have come. What is the reason that the other roots, how does one explain the extrema at the other uh, values at both omega values. So, let us assume that this is being done, this uh, requires this is just some routine calculation which I will do after, after this lecture. But this procedure will give us this point. Once we get this point, we know the largest sector. Yeah, suppose uh, this turns out to be equal to minus one over seventy, yeah, seventy seventy one, yeah, approximately. So we know from zero to seventy one circle criteria gives 
टाइम वेरिंग नॉन लिनियर सेक्टर फॉर टाइम वेरिंग नॉन लिनियरिटीज या सो वॉट अबाउट टाइम इन वेरियंट नॉन लिनियरिटीज दैट इज वॉट वी विल गेट फ्रॉम द पोपो प्लॉट दैट इज वॉट वी विल स्केच नाउ फॉर द सेम ट्रांसफर फंक्शन सो फॉर जी ऑफ जे ओमेगा इक्वल टू वन ओवर टू माइनस ओमेगा स्क्वायर प्लस जे ओमेगा विच टर्न्स विच इज इक्वल टू टू माइनस ओमेगा स्क्वायर माइनस जे ओमेगा डिवाइडेड बाय सो द पोपो प्लॉट कंसिस्ट ऑफ प्लॉटिंग रियल पार्ट ऑफ जी ऑफ जे ओमेगा on the horizontal axis just like in the nyquist plot but on the imaginary axis we are going to plot omega times the imaginary part of g of j omega so we are we are going to plot this is going to look very very much like the nyquist plot only that the vertical axis is going to be shifted but whether it comes and goes to the origin eventually or some other point on the vertical axis requires a little more careful calculation so the imaginary part we can check is nothing but omega over this whole thing and when we multiply that by another omega we get omega square yeah so omega times the imaginary part of g of j omega will be equal to omega square divided by omega square minus 2 plus omega square square of this plus this so as omega tends to infinity check that this is going to zero yeah this going to zero is nothing but to say that this goes and meets the origin real part is going to go to zero because it's a strictly proper transfer function since the nyquist plot goes to zero as omega tends to infinity because g is a strictly proper transfer function if the real part for the nyquist plot goes to zero real part for the popo plot will also go to zero because the popo plot differs from the nyquist plot only as far as the uh, distortion along the imaginary on the vertical axis is concerned but the imaginary part need not go to zero again because we are multiplying by uh, omega that is increasing that is becoming infinity so if the imaginary part were going to zero very very slowly the product would go to a non zero constant so anyway in this case we have verified that it goes to zero now the next question is to find a line that is um, of any positive slope such that the such that the popo plot is to the right of this line to the right and below so this is one such line of course another such line is this yeah another line is this but then we don't have to make this vertical anymore like we had to do in the circle criteria the important thing is that the the horizontal axis intersection should be as right as possible so notice that because of the property we are able to take this particular line that almost comes and touches this popo plot at the origin and is a line of positive slope any positive slope so uh, asymptotically uh, when we try this we get this particular point on the horizontal axis intersection to tend to zero yeah so let's say minus 0.000 this is also okay for the intersection of the line with positive slope such that the popo plot is to the right of this particular line so this gives us that the sector can be of the form for for popo criteria and of course for g of s we are speaking for this transfer function can take can take k equal to k tending to infinity yeah we can not take the vertical line itself yeah so 0 to infinity is also the largest sector for time invariant non linearities so for time invariant non linearities also so we get that the sector is as large as 0 to infinity 
uh, we already verified for this example that for sector of linearities also it is the sector 0 to infinity and this also refers to the fact that not just for a sector of linearities in other words for lines of any positive slope, but also for the sector of time invariant non-linearities where we are allowed to use a Popo criteria, we obtain that this is the largest sector. So, notice that this is strictly larger than the circle criteria largest sector. If you say that time varying non-linearities is also going to get allowed, then the sector will be strictly smaller. How small that depends on that that depends on this value as I said. So, so one thing we can one other thing we can conclude is with respect to the saturation non-linearity, we will not get periodic orbits for any gain k. Why? Because for any gain k, it will also be a sec it will also be inside the sector 0 to infinity of time invariant non-linearity. The saturation non-linearity is time invariant and for how, how much of a large gain k you multiply, it will still be inside the sector. So, we do not expect periodic orbits for the saturation non-linearity for this particular transfer function. Yeah, what remains to be checked is for the jump hysteresis, one can uh, calculate whether we will have so, this I would leave as an exercise for g of s is equal to 1 over s square plus s plus 2, check if eta of a equal to m plus j 4 b over pi a intersects. Which two intersects? Minus one over g of j omega and eta of a, or equivalently, and minus one over eta of a. Yeah, one can check these two intersect. It is not hard to plot the inverse of this because inverse of a line, inverse of a line in the in the complex plane will just become which has become a circle, half semicircle because this is only a half line. So, for this particular line, it will become suppose this is m, this will be minus 1 by m. For very far off points, it will tend to the origin. So, this is how the plot of uh, minus 1 over eta of a is. The as a from a is equal to 0 to a equal to infinity, one can check here also that a tend to infinity is going to be here. Uh, th this point that is farthest from the origin is going to be here when you take the inverse. So, uh, this is where a equal to infinity is and a equal to 0 is here. So, one can check if, if this intersects with the Nyquist plot of this and if it intersects at what value of omega and what a value at what amplitude value that will give us uh, the amplitude of the periodic orbit if any at the input to the jump hysteresis nonlinearity. So, this I would leave as an exercise. This uh, ends this lecture. So, we will see another topic in the next lecture. Yeah.